everybody and thank you for joining us on this podcast. Today I'll be following on from my session in early November where I sat with John Appleby to talk about the future of SAP operations. During that session we received over 30 questions from you our audience and today we want to follow up with some of those. I'm delighted to be rejoined by my good friend and colleague John Appleby. John, welcome back. Hey Branson, how are we doing? Happy Friday. Happy Friday to you as well. Um, so before we jump into the questions, John, and you know I haven't gone for all thirty, but I've I've have selected a good few in there to keep you uh, occupied. Um, so first, I see you attended the recent SAP Operations ASUG event in Philly. Um, I just want to ask, what were your key takeaways from that? Ah, uh, so 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 where do I start? I mean, and I, I I was sort of reflecting on this, and I I wrote a few words on it earlier in the week, but it it. it I, I look back in 2001 when when SAP kind of got started with with what has now become known as DevOps and and they were kind of ahead of their time in their thinking of, of sort of how to uh, create a system management or a, a solution manager that manages the overall solution landscape to, from design build and run uh, and it sort of um, it sort of reflected um, on that sort of 18 years on um, that the market has kind of moved on um, mm. And SAP hasn't, which which struck me as a, as a little bit sad, um, and, and uh, obviously that's 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 not necessarily true in in everything that SAP does because they have, you know, many SaaS solutions which from a from a DevOps perspective are just as just as class leading as as anyone else. Uh, but I'm just really referring to the kind of core uh, on premise apps that that most people you know, think of when they hear SAP. And that, of course, includes SBOR. Okay. Uh, it, it's clear that SAP has understood that they need to modernize what they do around DevOps, which is great. Mm. And they're creating a, a product called Cloud ALM, which looks interesting. Um, okay. The, the current version of that is really just focused on the S4 HANA public cloud customers, which is a <clears throat> very specific niche. Uh, it's an important niche, but it's a specific niche. And, and it looks like they're really going to extend that to cover what Solution Manager does. Um, so that's going to in, that includes design, build, run. It includes, I think, first really the the SaaS applications um, like like Success Factors um, and so on, um, Ariba, um, Field Glass, etc. That's that's the one side. And then and then the future product roadmap direction of sort of twenty twenty one, twenty two, twenty three uh, timeline includes. Uh, all of the on-premise apps and all the stuff that Solution Manager does today, which, which is quite exciting. Um, there are two things that, that are not in the product strategy, but I sort of have a, a personal opinion on, which is first, you know, um, I, I believe SAP need to containerize that and make it available on-prem. I think we'll see that. I mean, it's based upon the SAP cloud platform. So, so um uh, I, I believe that the cloud platform will, will become containerizable and, and will be able to be run on-prem, which means then you'll be able to take cloud ALM, run it either in the pub, you know, in, in a SaaS model, in a in a private cloud model, on a, in an on-prem model, uh, whatever your business needs, and deploy that against all of your ap applications. Um, I, I think that sounds like a good thing as a vision. Um, I, you know, and again, I, I'm not sure where that leaves Solution Manager in the long term. Okay, well, it'll be interesting to see what happens next there. I know we're waiting for them to give us a little bit more clarity in that space. So it's kind of a watch this space type moment, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, and, and you know, we, we need to cover this in more detail some other time, but this all relates to the 2025 deadline because Solution Manager is part of um, the business suite Business Suite 7, right. which is part of NetWeaver 7.5, which is all related back to the reseller agreements with Oracle and the end of life for uh, Java 8, which is 2025. That sort of is all one one hairball right now that, that hasn't been unpacked. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, second thing I'm going to ask you about is you've also been posting over the last few days about the topic of SAP operations and DevOps maturity. Uh, with your la latest post coming, I think it was last night, around the four levels of SAP DevOps maturity. Without spoiling the post for those who want to read it, want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. And this all sort of comes into my, my general thinking on this topic right now. You know, if you look at what Oracle are talking about with their with their database cloud, um, if you look at what what people like um, uh, 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 Salesforce or Workday are, are, have done already, um, you know, you, you you don't have to worry about the application. 
it, it has a service level agreement and it's and it's run by the vendor. Um, but they do have to worry about it and they do have to swallow the costs. So if they have a lot of hamsters and wheels keeping things running, th that's a big problem. Um, as an SAP customer, it's kind of a lot more real than that in general because um, you... You have fires, and I, you know, I was, I was just, uh, I came back from customers in, in, in California, and, you know, they, they, they literally are running from, from one issue to another, solving problems as they find them, and, and I call that, you know, reactive mode, and, you mm -hmm. know, if you're a SaaS customer of, of success factors, um, you, you don't experience that because SAP manages that for you, but if you're an on-prem or, or a hyperscale cloud S4 customer, or even to, to a degree a HEC customer, um, that's a problem for you today. And most, in my opinion, most SAP customers uh, didn't get to, to go, didn't get past the reactive mode. And I, I've got th sort of three that follow that. Um, I call it proactive, automatic, and self-healing. But, um, mm. uh, um, you know, my view is, I just take like a simplest of examples. Why can't we recognize that a security vulnerability was released. Great. And by the way, your, your, your iPhone, your Mac, they do this already, they do it overnight. Yep. Um, and it's happening more and more frequently, let's face it. Yeah, and we need, and it, 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 this is, it's not just happening more frequently, it's, it's a much more important and visible issue for social economic issues than it was five years ago. But we should be able to recognize, A, a security event has occurred. Um, B, there is a fix available for it. So we should be able to download that fix from SAP and then uh, overnight, immediately, in my view, but this could be configurable, we push that out to all the dev test systems and sandboxes. Now we kick off the sanity checks and the and the and the regression checks. And by the way, we had this thing, yeah, yeah, the whole lot. That that's all automated, and then it goes into a workflow. And, and that, that workflow goes through for approvals, technical approval and managerial approval. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now the fix is, is in the schedule. Now we have patch Tuesdays. That fix is, in the, is in, the, in the line for patch Tuesdays. Tuesday comes along, it gets automatically updated. Um, and, and that from an enterprise perspective is, is, is what I would call self-healing. It's not 100% automatic self-healing because we want to have some checks and balances and change management. We don't control. want to lose controls. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to lose that. But from, from a, you know, the, the customer that I met yesterday, they said that they, they patch their kernel once a year. Obviously, they won't say who it was, once a year. <laughs> so, so, you know, if, they, if, they didn't have, if that patch wasn't a few weeks ago, there is, a, there is a priority one vulnerability in the SAP kernel, in the, in the current SAP kernel. Um, and if you didn't patch in the last month, you've got that problem in your system right now. Right. So, so mm -hmm. um, you know, re really, uh, I think we have a really interesting time to come and we, we need to think about how we get out of reactive to proactive because once we're in proactive, we can start to invest time in aut automation and self-healing. Right. Just as simple as that. Awesome. And I'll put the link to, the, to, to that post as well in the show notes so that uh, anybody who's interested can uh, pop along and have a look. So it's a really interesting read. Um, okay. I think it's time we started getting into some of those questions if you're ready, John. Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. Okay, the first one here is from Vinod. Um, we can all agree that there's a gap between the reality of today and the future of DevOps. What, in your opinion, uh, or what is your opinion on how that gap is impacting businesses from a profit and loss perspective, both directly and indirectly? Yeah, I mean, so so there's there's two sides to it, right? So you've got direct costs, uh, and you you know, I, I talk to customers that have got tens or hundreds of SAP operations people that that keep the, that are sitting there keeping things running and keeping mm. the machine the machine alive. Um, that that is a very poor use of extremely experienced resources. You know, we're we're not talking about about unqualified people here. We're talking about people typically who have graduate degrees and many times they have five or ten years experience in the industry. And actually a customer I spoke to this week, they said that they spent eight hours of their best people every week producing a report for the CIO. Wow. <laughs> and so, so that is, that's, that is direct cost. I'm not saying that you can necessarily get rid of these people, but you, you can deploy them so much more effectively, creating automata to make the business run more effectively versus um, having them producing reports. That's just, that is literally just busy work and it, and it adds, 
and, and whilst that report might inform what they need to do, you've got to automate that so you can actually go and make things better. So, so, that, so that's, that's direct costs. And you know, I, I talk to customers who are looking to automation that, that absolutely look to reduce the FTEs doing day-to-day -day operations and to redeploy them into the business to do value add, customer work, billable work, whatever, whatever else can be done. There's, there's never a lack of things to be done in the operations world. That's not the issue. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's just a question of what didn't get done. So that's direct. Exactly. And then, you, and then you've got, uh, uh, and then you've got kind of uh, business costs and direct. So, you know, I I talk to a manufacturing customer, and uh, they frequently have uh, priority one issues, which take systems down, and equipment does not come off the manufacturing line. That is literally business lost, right yep. there, and. There's absolutely no reason for that in 2019. Tools are available to automate operations for SAP and everything else so you can get a view and you can get ahead of those outages. And, and, then, um, and, and then you've got the, the, the kind of more um, indirect benefits of that. So at, like I discussed, we already discussed the security thing as, as a simple example, but there, there are many other examples where um, we improve operations and that has a, a, a an intangible benefit because you didn't ha didn't receive some issue and, and the cost of a security breach and you know it amazes me that there are not more you don't hear about this more in the SAP world but you know you read about this in the media and it typically is, isn't impacted by SAP it's typically um, you know custom software but the, the same vulnerabilities exist in SAP if you do not patch your system and follow best practices and, yep, and makes a lot of sense. That has a real commercial impact. Yep, absolutely. Okay, our second question is from Alexander. Uh, do you think a culture of DevOps can be implemented in a company that focuses and relies on waterfall methodologies to build the business? That's a great question. It, it's a good question. Uh, it, it's also a really easy question. Uh, so yes. Mm. <laughs> so next question. <laughs> I'm kidding, but I'll give a little bit more detail. But I, I, I just don't. I don't view. Uh, DevOps being attached to any particular methodology. Um, in, in fact, you know, in, in most cases, <clears throat> let's like take a simple build DevOps scenario where I want to build out a set of sandbox systems, and um, let's say I, I implemented some tool which does post copy automation and automate system mm -hmm. copies. So now I say, well, I want these production systems and I want them copied into this place to create sandboxes. Um, that's pretty much a waterfall process, however you want to look at it. You've got right. the beginning, you've got a set of steps, and the end. Now, what DevOps does is it automates it, it improves the speed, it, re it reduces the number of man hours involved, um, it probably um, you know, deletes some production data or, or, or anonymizes some data, um, probably does some testing. Um, so it, it simplifies and, and streamlines and automates and reduces the time to do it. Um, but it doesn't make it any less waterfall. So um, yeah. you can absolutely use the DevOps in a, in a, in a waterfall sense. Um, the, you know, the, there's the benefits to, to Agile are sort of separate, and in my view, and related to you know, how, um, how you build software. But yeah, the answer is yes. And, and I think in, in that scenario, when you're talking about DevOps, there is a link, at least in people's minds, between the term DevOps and the term Agile. Whereas actually it's less of the agile with a capital A being the, you know, the methodology and more a business becoming agile with a small a. That, that's what it's more closely linked to, but people confuse that quite a bit. Yeah, I learned about the phrase caponym this, this week. That is a, a word. Capon? Capon? Capon. A caponym is a, is a word which has a different meaning when it's capitalized and uncapitalized. Oh, nice. Piece of information you never right, needed cool. to know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So this this is what this is why we're here. <laughs> and you're quite right that the DevOps allows your business to operate in a more agile way, but that's that's mm -hmm. that is that is that has got nothing to do with agile methodology with Scrum versus waterfall right. versus Wagile versus whatever else. Um, but DevOps, yeah, whatever other term people like coming up with, whatever you want to come up with, but DevOps certainly supports 
being agile as an organization because with automation you do things much more quickly i mean the sort of we were doing some tests around you know just a simple kernel update and we found that with automation we can get this down to, to below two minutes including bringing systems down bringing them up running patches and tests and and, yep. and, and all of that that's a you know that could be a two-day effort if you if you have an outsource organization managing it by the time you created the the service requisition and blah 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 so so um it certainly supports being more agile as a business. Agreed. Okay, I'm going to move us on just in the interest of time. So the next one is from Bernhard. How important is the right infrastructure and tools to implementing effective SAP DevOps? Um, you know, sort of uh, the answer to that, again, I'll keep the answer simple. Uh, very and not at all <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, and what, what I mean to say is... Um, you know, there are distinct benefits of, let's just be specific, of using the hyperscalers. You, you know, you, 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 you don't need to acquire machinery um, mm -hmm. to set up new systems. It's not three month lead times to get tin on the ground. It's literally yeah. minutes. And you, and you can get around uh, and, and you can get around some of that, but, but that's the reality. Is, you know, I can type one GFUSE command. It's a long command, but it will mm -hmm. create the system that I wanted and the availability zone that I wanted with the security and network settings that I wanted and the build image that I wanted. It'll it'll bring it up and it'll work in, in 10 minutes time. So, so you know, there are distinct advantages of that from a DevOps perspective because we talk about our system copy example. Well, now we can extend our system copy example to GFUSE and bring up the system that you wanted with the right volume groups and the right and, and, and everything else, CPU, memory, and that can be automated end to end. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, um, if you're a VMware customer, so, so say hi Sanjay. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, Sanjay is a good good friend of SAP. But but um, if you if you're a VMware customer, you get a chunk of that benefit, right? You don't you don't have the elasticity you get from the hyperscale cloud. But you can certainly apply the same DevOps scenarios to set up VMware systems, and they can you know if you have a VMware farm, you can have um, effective elas elasticity um, that probably meets your requirements. The, the same, by the way, ironically, has been true with, with um, you know, big iron systems like um, IBM um, P-Series. So, you know, we set up big iron that has capacity and we can actually automate um, creating uh, logical virtual machines um, w within that context. So, so um, it, it, it the, the world of using a hyperscale certainly provides elasticity um, that you didn't have. But if you're an IBM P-Series Big Iron customer, you can still get that. Fair enough. That makes a lot of sense. Awesome. Okay, our next one comes from Arun. Uh, do you see the SAP Cloud Platform playing a role in the future of SAP DevOps for on-premise customers? Yeah, I mean, I mean, my, my personal opinion is I say SAP haven't... Um, haven't released this as a strategy, but my personal opinion is mm. that is that is that the cloud platform needs to be containerizable on prem, and and they've built it in a containerized way, so that that's something it, it's completely that, possible. <laughs> yeah, so so they they did they thought about that, and and I know I know um, I knew Bjorn Gurki when he was still at SAP he had that in mind, um, mm. but my view is if you look at if you look at product, let's just take PI an example. You have CPI, which is this this um, cloud version of, of PI, um, my, my view is that, that SAP has, has got to transition to that as the primary enterprise service bus. So we talked in their capital markets there about how they're going to focus on uh, single product offerings that would be best of yep. breed rather than having multiple. Well, here's the problem. So NetWeaver PI is based on NetWeaver 7.5 Java. That's, that's mm -hmm. end of life, end of 24, end of. No, no. The, the the current statement is no extended maintenance, no customer specific. I, I think you can always buy customer specific maintenance, but you know the the Java eight that that is based upon is end of line. The the yeah. the logical strategy for that is to use the cloud platform, make it available on premise, so that customers can run CPI and they can transition from NetWeaver Java onto NetWeaver um, PI, um, PO. Sorry now. They've, they've renamed that product. It was XI, then PI, then PO, um, and transition that onto CPI. For me, that makes um, the, perf the perfect sense. And now our DevOps scenarios can include those, those hybrid cloud scenarios where you have uh, a, an on-prem VM container 
um, Kubernetes or whatever, um, which which will uh, which you can then deploy on demand. I think that's really exciting. Yep, completely agree. Okay, our next question comes from Peter. Um, how can customers find the balance between business as usual in their DevOps maturity journey and innovation to drive business growth? Um, I mean, we, we've sort of already covered that, but I'll, but I'll be explicit. You've got to get out of reactive mode. So you've got you, you've got to, you know, here's my advice to, to any head of operations that's got this situation where everybody's involved in business as usual. Cut some of the team out. So you guys, you and you, so you've got 20 people, take two of them, 10% of the team, take that capacity out. And so you two are responsible only for putting tools in place which, which do automation with a view mm -hmm. that the tasks done by the other 18 people are no longer required. Not, not because you want to get rid of these people, but because you've got to deploy them to do DevOps. It's insane that you've got a team of 20 people that just sit there doing repetitive activities. Cut some of that team out and put them in and say, you're responsible, you and you, innovation. You'll get tools in place as quickly as you can and prioritize the things that are being done in terms of volume of activities. You know, you know I just give you that simple example of a customer where they're spending eight hours a day of combined team. It was almost everyone on the team was spending some time on this report, creating a report. That is that's unacceptable. Their first job should be to replace that report with a with a piece of automation, because the moment you start doing that, you you get you, you get a flywheel effect, because now you've got first you start with two people that are not doing it. Before you know it, you've freed up another two, and they can then move out, out of operations into innovation, and and you, you you get this cycle of operations where you then start to move to be proactive, and you're actually solving problems ahead of time and building automata to actually solve the problems that you've got, it, it will pay dividends. And also I've yet to come across somebody in an operations team who doesn't get excited when they're asked to go away and innovate and come up with these tools to automate stuff that they used to do manually. It's it's their, it, it's what they live for if you give them the chance. I, yeah, as I said, these are, these are typically very highly qualified individuals producing reports. Yep. Okay, we're getting towards the end of this now. So um, our next question is from Arwell, which is how do you keep a lid on SAP operations actual versus forecast spend in an on-demand, potentially hybrid cloud environment? Yeah, I mean, Arwell and I talked about this um, earlier in the week, but you know, I, 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 the, these, these answers are all quite simple. And then the details are a little bit more complicated. By doing it is the answer. So by, mm -hmm. by watching the costs. And he gave me the example of a customer, I think at 8,000 snapshots. Um, so you've just got to have somebody who's responsible for cost management in the cloud because you, you don't, um, you know, it's like, it's like having an unlimited uh, cell phone plan that actually has a bunch of extra costs associated with it. Um, before you know it, you start racking up these extra costs and you didn't check your bill and, you know, you, you're contracted at, at $40 a month and all of a sudden it's 240 Mm -hmm. um, and, and how do you solve that? Well, <laughs> you apply some controls. Uh, and there, there are some very specific things you can do uh, around automation. So, you, well, f first of all, around contracts. So, you know, first of all, you, you negotiate a discount with your cloud, cloud provider based upon volume. They'll all do this, especially if you're spending the kind of money that many large enterprises are. Um, and then second, you decide uh, which systems should be reserved systems. Because if you've got production systems, you should absolutely be using reserved instances. You know, in, in, in the case of Amazon, a reserved instance is typically 30 to 35% of the cost. That's one third of the cost of yeah. an on-demand system for the same period. And so, so that makes a ton, of, a ton of sense. On the other hand, um, if you've got um, uh, development systems which are required um, eight by five, uh, maybe, in some instances, they're not required for. You can shut. You can then use automation, and you can use software to bring those systems down, shut down the cloud systems cleanly, uh, shut down SAP database operating system and and and, and cloud VM. And uh, you don't want to use reserve instances in that system. In that case, you can do the calculations. Yeah. It's less expensive to actually bring the systems down. Equally, if you've got like a parallel pro payroll system, which comes up once a month to do a payroll test, bring it up once a month. Guess what? You only pay five hours. That's five instead of uh, how many hours are in a month? Lots. 
So absolutely. But you, but you actually but you've got to proactively go about doing this in a systematic way, and that's what a lot of customers fail to do, and because the costs become phenomenal in the hyperscale cloud if you don't control them. Yep, could, couldn't agree more. Uh, John, I think we're going to have to leave it there shortly. We're going to give you one more question. We might cover a few more questions over the next few um, episodes as we as we go through these. We'll come back to this. Um, but I think there's one here I think you're going to love, which is how do you pursue SAP DevOps principles in a vendor AMS environment? Um, and it depends a little bit on the culture of the company. But but my experience is that, that when... Uh, when you have an AMS environment, so you, so you, you outsource management of systems and, and almost all large en enterprises have done this in some way or another, you, you retain some sort of local team and you retain the, the customer I was in yesterday. I want to say they were still retain four people uh, despite the fact that they're contracted with one of the big um, outsource partners. So um, the first thing is you've still got some control and those people should be absolutely focused on two things, which is first of all tools and second of all um control of outsource partner and contracting. So um, I, I would, if, if I were in that situation, the first thing I would do would be to implement tools which automate SLA reporting. Mm -hmm. Now you can have a commercial yep. conversation. And, and um, in almost no case does the outsource partner get to determine the tools. I mean, they can bring their tools if they want to to the table and they all sell a vision of the tools that they've got. But as a, as, a, as a customer, as an end, as an end user, you, br you can bring the tools to the table and you tell them to use them. Now, you might say, well, shouldn't my outsource partner be doing that? Well, in theory, yes. Um, in practice, if you're not at the beginning of a contract and you're not contracting with them, then you've got what you've got because they manage it as a, as a set of margins. And so they think of it as people uh, plus tools plus margin equals cost uh, to mm -hmm. customers. And so they don't want to change that model typically during contract life cycle. So if you're in the middle of a contract life cycle, implement tools and say, hey guys, you've got to use these. That's the deal. Mm -hmm. and, and in most cases, they, they don't have a problem with that because the tools improve their life. You don't get the, the benefit of that now as a customer from a commercial perspective. You get better operations, which is, has got its own value. But when it comes back to a contract renewal, you can say, well, I can see what the time you're spending. Let's have a talk about the, the effort actually involved to manage our systems now. Yep. Yeah. I think that's a great that's a great starting point. Okay, that brings us to the end of our time uh, this time, John. You'll be glad to hear. Any parting words before we close out? Um, yeah, no, just, just probably just, I've said this a couple of times, but I'll just reinforce it. Um, you know, especially in my travels, this week spending time with customers it's just reminded me how many people how many customers are in this reactive mode of sap operations it's it's a it's a real it's a real shock to me um how many people uh and i reckon it's it's over a billion dollar industry of people just doing repetitive work in the sap ecosystem and that is just money so badly spent Agreed. When when there are real business problems to solve, uh, and so I just say there's just just a call to action for people to say, how do we reduce that that effort which is done that doesn't need to be done? Yep, great closing point. Okay, all that remains for me now is to say thank you, John, for joining me again on this podcast, and to thank you all for joining us, and we hope to see you on the next session. See you next time. Mm -hmm.